Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> I did not print mine to? out. Who are you talking I don't know, to? I don't know who I'm talking to yet. People. Well, I know at least one. I'm talking to Honoré, and then yes. we'll see who else is out there. That's all right. Hello, who else is out there? How are you? <laughs> I'm Lucas. <laughs> I help nonfiction <laughs> authors turn their wonderful books into courses. How about you, Honoré? How are you doing? I help aspiring authors to write, publish, and monetize their nonfiction book. Love it. Yes. Love it. Yeah. We've got quite the episode today. I've seen some pretty big interest on this, and I'm not sure if it's just because I posted yeah. the um posted the invite placeholder slash scheduling earlier than than usual but yeah. I've, I've just gotten a lot of feedback from people like hey this is one of the things i worry about you know because some of them have already published yeah. their nonfiction book and others are getting ready yeah. to jump in yeah. yeah so when can you get that roi and how do you do it and all that stuff so how's your week been <laughs> Do you want this in English or French? Because Ooh. I had to, uh, for those who don't know, I have been learning French. I think I'm going to be learning French for the whole rest of my life because it's just really hard. I had no exposure as a child. So I have a, a, a former business coaching client of mine who is French and he indulges me by every week talking in French with me for 30 minutes. So I have to come to our calls with phrases that I have taught myself and new vocabulary. And so I have this, the French English Visual Dictionary. Oh, look at that. Look how thick this kit is. Yes. It's actually really cool because it shows pictures of things and then it gives you the vocabulary for it. It's really awesome. It's a great resource. Oh, it's pretty. It's gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just this incredible. I mean, it's le glossy. legitimately everything. It's like, this is... This is an Olympic sized swimming pool and it's like the lane rope is a cord to couloir, right? So like if I want to know like the nitty gritty of something, handrails, um, wow. anyway, all the things, super nerding out on it. But I had to tell him that my husband has been sick for an entire week, which means that he is not feeling well, which gives me great um, anxiety. And I don't normally have anxiety, so I don't like it. Um, and so I've had dog duty. My dog, the new dog, see previous episode had <laughs> surgery. So the dog is on the drugs <laughs> and we have two shifts here in the quarter household. We have the honoré shift, which starts at four 30 in the morning. And we have the Byron shift, which ends at between two and three in the morning. And so the dogs are like, we want to go out when we go out. So this girl has been up in the middle of the night, like with one eye taking the dogs out. <laughs> Stand in the watch. So I go to bed and then I wake up because the dogs want to go out and I bundle up because it's been very, very cold. Take the dogs out, get back in the bed. So I'm a little low on the sleep, but I am, I am powered by... Texas pecan, <laughs> positive by energy and endorphins because I haven't given up my workout, which Renee knows all about. Hi, Renee. And she's saying hello. Hello. Yeah. So how has my week been? It's been a little low on the sleep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm ready. I'm ready for um, uh, the week, the weekend. I think I, um, I think I actually asked Byron the same question twice. Like, do you like in the to... same sentence? Yeah. Like, well, I said, <laughs> and he answered me. I said, I'm so tired. I said, do you want a yogurt? And he said, no. And I was like, well, how about a yogurt? <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. And he was like, no, <laughs> no. So anyway, it's been, it's been an interesting, it's been an interesting week. This is the part where I'm really grateful that I work for myself. Yes. Because I've been able to kind of manage the fatigue with, um, um, uh, Nappuccinos, which for those of you who don't know, it is a dose of caffeine 
followed by like a 25 minute nap, which allows me to recharge my batteries and then get break, get back in there. Like, you know, yeah. the, the, the entrepreneur equivalent to rub some dirt on it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, that's been, you've got a lot going on over there. Yeah. Yeah. We've got teenagers. That's our thing. <laughs> yeah, my your daughter, daughter became a teenager. Yeah. Yeah. We've officially have three teenagers now. My daughter turned 13 yesterday, but we had her party over the weekend and just yeah. what a joy. What an awesome time. She uh, is so gorgeous, your daughter. I was looking at those pictures she's a good and I was like, I think Lucas is probably doing two things while Tammy is taking these photos. One, cleaning his guns, and two, <laughs> drinking bourbon. This is this was the picture I had in my head. Yeah. <laughs> of you sitting on the porch with your oil and your cloth with a with a, with a little tumbler with the dog next to you. Like this, this is how I picture. <laughs> you have a very calm image in your head of me which I appreciate because my image of me in my head with that is like anarchy. <laughs> is it? So it's more, um, it's more the end of Die Hard than the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's still a Christmas movie. <laughs> so all this and is we'll still fight happening. You about that. We'll fight yeah. you about that if you don't believe us. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's, it's funny because a lot of it also is like watching my oldest son and my middle kid, uh, like manage their obligations because they're getting closer to adulthood and oh, yeah. they're really good at what they do and they're dedicated and they care they're in theater. My oldest son does tech theater. He's lighting and sound and all the things, but he's like their master electrician at the school. And yeah. he's trying to balance that with really demanding school program he's in. And I'm, I'm just, you know, it's a lot of like, I hate to say, but it's a lot of, you know, dadding is a lot like life coaching at that phase. It's like, Hey, you know, here's how you approach your obligations. Yeah. Here's how you approach balancing your energy. Like here's how you yeah. approach what matters. And you know, you, you can't just right. say yes to everything. You have to tell them you have some, when some you guidelines. Say yes to something you say no to everything else. Right. So it's been, yeah. It's been a lot of that. Also, the book launch is, you know, upon us. So it's been a lot of work on on that reviewing files and doing this stuff. And oh, by the way, still trying to enjoy things like reading, right? Like you and I are avid readers. And I'm like squeezing two audiobooks in and reading this one for research and doing that. <laughs> Look at this. We yeah. are stacking the we have Stacking all the people. the people. So we've got Renee who's telling everyone at work about your book, which is cool. Cause I know you have a super fan in her office now. <laughs> and, and we have Wayne and Charlie. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Wayne. Charlie. Hi, Bob. Um, I think pops. my brother might be watching. Hi, Justin. Oh, now this is Bob Latino. Everybody pay attention. Nonfiction author in the room. <laughs> Bob, Bob is so great. If you what is Bob's book? Bob, we need a link to your book in our chat. I actually have a copy up in here, but to, for the sake of not like destroying the feed with all the noise and stuff, um, he okay. writes about root cause analysis and his family has been um has been yeah, Bob, if you want to put a link to your book in the in the in the comments, um, that'd be great because then the people can see it. But uh, uh, honestly, Bob's family is business for over 40 years was root cause analysis and reliability engineering and all the things and just fascinating Are you translate that for this for the <laughs> yeah you you want the you want the, uh, in the room? here's the translation yeah. of root cause analysis you think something yeah. caused the problem and they actually know how to find out exactly what caused the problem but in what in an argument in a machine you pick your poison. It could be something. Oh. Yeah. It, it's basically a method by which to decompose events and, um, and sequences oh, of things. Well, I mean, obviously we have the people that we blame. That's <laughs> well, that is, it's so funny. You bring that <laughs> up. Call me, Bob. I have, the, I have the name of the, <laughs> of the root cause of all of the problems. That's actually, uh, that's actually a funny thing that you say, because it's almost always step one is like, whoever you think the problem is just go set that aside because this is never about finding someone to blame. It's all about the things it's like, 
Were there policies? Mm -hmm. Are there sequences of events that like, was there a mm -hmm. gap in your procedures? Like all these things. Oh, by the way, were there external forces you don't know about or consider or any yeah, of those things? Of course. There's a I know. Whole lot to Take it. responsibility, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind all of crazy because right. when you, when you sit down with someone like Bob, you're like, oh, so you do RCA and you're thinking in the context of engineering. Yeah. And then you're like, so tell me about some of the cases you've worked and they've worked hospital cases where there's been deaths mm. under healthcare. Yeah, and, sure. Sure. Uh, that terrorism. Makes yeah. Counterterrorism. Um, I mean, worked all mm. kinds of really interesting cases, but, um, but Bob's uh, just one of the most kind and respected people I've ever worked with in, in the uh, reliability industry. So, and he's good at drinking beer and eating eating uh eating uh well, chicken wings i'm with going me. to get that book um i'm always interested in that when publishing a book it's one of the reasons i have the protocol in place for publishing any book now is to avoid having those problems so anyway I, did you get any gifts this week um i did <laughs> So I get, I get this package and it's this tall box, square yeah. like rectangular box. I can't say that without wanting to scream because it's not a rectangle. It's an actual three-dimensional shape. And anyways, I get this box and I open it up and there's this plant in there. And it's like this too. And it's, let me tell you something. They wrap those things up, man. It was mm -hmm. like, there was nothing left of that box by the time I got that thing out of there. And it was perfectly unscathed. I got a money tree looks kind of like the one sitting next to you, but a little mm. bit smaller. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Oh, do we have Hank here? Hank Kosovar. I think Hank is our LinkedIn user unidentified this guy. <laughs> Cause I'm seeing some Hank mentions by Bob. Yeah. Pops. So yeah. Hank was, was one of my, uh, and is one of my, uh, engineering mentors. Nice. This and is just, cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I got to be on my, I got to be on good behavior right now. I got like three, right. four dads in the room. <laughs> yeah. They all have all right. like license to smack me. <laughs> so, so what have you been reading this week? <laughs> well, I've been reading the French English visual dictionary. Um, right. I'm still reading Arte. I'm still reading the daily stoic. Um, I have a, a secret book project for an author that I can't, I have the books right there, but I can't show you what they are. So I have gotten final approval from the author to publish the book. So it's ready. Awesome. It's ready to, um, through the protocol, I get signed up by the author and then Dino creates all the files for all of the different places to mm. upload. So I got the final approval on that. I've been through it. I don't know, 4 million times, give or take a million. Um, and then I can talk about this one. Uh, Beth Walker is working on her book, Buying College Better, which will be coming in May. And so I've been um, reading through that manuscript several times. And uh, it's very, very good. It's very, very good. So if you have nice. uh, college bound kids, you're going to want. Yeah. And her whole thing, and I don't think I'm speaking out of school here, um, her whole approach to buying college is it it is not dissimilar to buying a home oh, however okay. most people um, allow a teenager and a school guidance counselor to make the decision <laughs> on how they're right. investing potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars and she applies what's best for the child their mm. academic prowess their interests their personality along with affordability. What can a, a parent or parents actually afford for college and then finding the right college with the right program. So it's this very interesting uh, ballet almost of, wow. of information, bringing it all together because most parents are like, well, if my kid wants to go to Princeton, my kid's going to go to Princeton. If they can get in, you know, I only need one kidney. <laughs> I was about to say, I'm going to jail for the stuff right. I'm going to have to do to get this kid in Princeton. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's happening. That's right. Well, and so if you think about it from the, what can the parents afford? What's the best education for the child long term? You know, hashtag recovering attorney, right? Right. 
So when you add all of those things up and have her apply her process, and it's really an affordable process, right? That that she is she's asking the question, you know, would you spend ten thousand dollars to save a hundred thousand dollars? Well, yes, right. Yeah. And but most people just go, this is where my kid wants to go to school. There's an emotional, or they like the mascot, or their boyfriend or girlfriend or best friend or whatever went to that school, or that's where mom and dad went. Not yes. thinking, is this the best place for them to go for their long term career? success and what's going to what's going to be left in the wake of putting that kid in college so we've just been having great conversations so kent's the ghostwriter on the project beth is the author i'm the producer we're having a wonderful time working on this book project and then i have a couple of other book projects that are in the works right now that i'll talk about at a later date so um that's what i'm reading and You're reading a lot uh, of that yeah <laughs> i'm reading a lot of that and then i am uh reading uh, the Frozen River by Ariel Lahan, which is a just a beautiful historical fiction book that I unfortunately was reading before I went to bed. I could get in bed and read a chapter or two chapters, but I'm reading a sentence <laughs> conking out. So I'll get back to it. Nice. I've got a, I've got another week or so that it's before it's due to the library. So <laughs> well. Yeah. I've uh what are you reading? I've been I've been really leaning on audiobooks this last week pretty heavy because of all the driving mm. we were doing. Mm. Um so hey, you know, if you're not familiar with like current uh teenage parent life, they really don't want to hang out much when you're in the car. They all love their earbuds and just zone out. So it gives me an opportunity to put an e uh to put an audiobook on. <laughs> yes. So yeah, you consider like that's how I'm kind of keeping track of my time in the car right now is I'm like, damn, I'm zipping through these audio books. I'm like, oh my God, how much am I driving? Right? Like Tammy and I are just never stopping. So right now I, I finished book three of the Dead South series from Zach Bohannon. Um, All right. And started uh, How to Sell a Haunted House from Grady Hendrix, which is one of the year's bestsellers in the horror community. And it's also been uh, shortlisted or not shortlisted, but he's made the final list for the Stoker, um, the Bram Stoker Award, oh, wow. which is, okay. so I'm like, I got to hurry up and read this book before everyone's talking about it even more than they already are. Um, and then I finished, um, I finished Trackers, which was the EMP book. Oh, right. Uh, that I was oh, reading. Oh, speaking of EMP, at and is down. I'm sure there's womp, no womp. relation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's definitely not a relation. We wouldn't be sitting here right now. <laughs> Um, I'm just saying, you know what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And then I started a second EMP as soon as that was done. This one's called One Second After. So technically, I'm sitting in How to Sell a Haunted House and One Second After in kind of tandem here. Um, mm. But yeah, good times. Yeah, yeah. I Good forgot one before times. we jump into our topic. I am listening to The Joy of Movement by Kelly McGonigal, speaking of oh. audiobooks. And it's fascinating. Um, I have learned a new word in English, endocannabinoid, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. So if you're just wondering <laughs> why you have anxiety or depression or um, – you're just struggling in some area of your life. It could be that you're just not moving quite enough and a little bit of movement 20 minutes a day releases those natural, um, those natural chemicals that prevent homicide. Yay. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good thing if you're trying to avoid prison. Yeah. You know, if you're trying to get into prison, I mean, there's probably other ways you can do it where it's yeah, <laughs> a little sure. less impactful on someone else, but <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's been, that's been a, it's, it's been a real great time of reading and consuming. And I'm trying to fight the urge to start another book right now because I've got some yeah. friends that are all reading the same book. And I'm like, oh, I want to be in there because I got a little bit of FOMO going on with the, yeah. um, anyone home from It'll Michael come. Singliger. It'll yeah. come. It's just going to yeah. have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> so, come. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. you want to you want to dive into the ROI conversation? Yeah, I think so. Let's do it. Um, I so think so. I think a little background on why we're talking about this particular topic is relevant. You brought this 
subject to the, I to did. the table last I week. Did. Yeah. So I am doing um, custom books. So uh, Honor a Quarter of a Spoke Book Productions are the, the custom books that I'm doing. And very often, one of the first things someone will ask me in a discovery conversation is, when am I going to get an ROI on my book? Related specifically to how many books do I have to sell to make back the initial, initial investment? Nice. And so that is a, that's a, that's a great question. It's a, it's a common question, but it's almost the wrong question or it's not the most effective question. And so let's first talk about what is the, the ROI? What, what is ROI? It's the return on investment, right? So it's you, you're investing a certain amount of money to go from blank page to produced book, whether that's you writing it and publishing it yourself or you using a service or a person to help make that happen, right? So you want to get the return on investment. My goal for my clients is to get a 10x return on investment year over year for at least a decade, which requires a level of intentionality, purposefulness, and skill that um, in order to make that happen, right? So setting that aside, where the ROI is going to come from, we first have to think about what the job of the book is. So what's happening is people are coming to me and they're saying, okay, so I want to do a book with you and I understand what the cost is. How soon can I get that cost back from selling books? And so we have to take making money from setting books aside and dive into, well, what's the job of the book? If the job of the book is to get you clients, chances are you're not going to sell the book, you're going to give it away, which means you're going to invest more money in buying author copies at a very low amount of money per book. But still, you're going to be spending more money to have copies of the book to give away in order to get that big upside. So we can use a course as an example, Lucas, we can use... Um, one of your courses as an example. So I think uh, monetize your book with a course goes with the book goes with monetize your book with a course course. And that course is seven fifty. Uh, yeah. Normally it's priced at seven fifty. Right. right now it's on sale for two ninety seven. Oh, is it really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've lowered the price this year to try okay. and help some people out that may find it Perfect. a little bit more okay. accessible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's really helpful. So when you think about um, but buying author copies, your author copies yeah. are $3 a book, give or take, whether if you're doing soft cover, if you paperback, if you're doing a hardcover edition, you're probably six or seven, eight, maybe. Right. Right. Am I in the window? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, definitely yeah. by page count and topic and all those things. Yeah. Right. So I'm, we're looking at, let's say, let's say $7 a book. Cause I like the number seven. I like the number eight, but I like the number seven when it comes to buying things better. <laughs> right. So if you give someone a copy of your book and we're talking physical copy and they spend $297 on your course or seven fifty when it's not on sale, then that's cool because you invested the money to create the book and the course. And now you have a return on investment. If you if it costs, um, let's use another round number, seven thousand dollars to produce the book in the course, then you must sell uh, a hundred, a thousand, whatever the number is, right? In order to get that ROI and get back to zero, and then to start making money. Now, anyone watching this is going, obviously, she's not a math person, and you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the breaking right? point. I should have, I should have used a round number like a thousand. I should have said, if your course is a thousand and your book costs $10, you're going to give away a $10 book, but you're going to make $990. And so in order to pay yourself back for creating the book and the course to get to your break even point, which is not the goal. It's interesting to me because most authors will, aspiring authors will say, how much do I need in order to, to break even. And what I really want is them to have that 10 X times 10 or that 100 X return on their investment over time, which is why my clients are generally very successful business owners and entrepreneurs who charge a, a, a or are paid or compensated a large amount for what it is that they do. So we can use, um, what can we use? Let's see. Um, I don't, I, I can't use the like the most prevalent uh, 
example in my mind for something that someone gets paid for. Um, but let's say that, well, I can use, I can use my January book example. So I, I had two books, two custom books that published in January and one of the authors uh, charges 5,000 a month or 60,000 a year for his services. And the book that he did with me was $60,000. And so to get one client broke even because he was a pretty effortless client and we were able to sail through the process, his book files were done, done and done. And he was able to order advanced author copies two months in advance. So we had a January pub date, but in November, he received his advanced author copies and was sending them out to his prospective clients. So the book provided great information and insight, but there was a, something that he mentioned in the book that even I couldn't get out of him. It was a little bit of a secret sauce. Hmm. And I was like, I kind of want the secret sauce, right? And it was like, oh, it's a black box. But he charges five grand a month for that. And it's a year long contract. And so he had gotten 12, 13, 14, 15 clients before the book launched. Oh, wow. So he was like, this is phenomenal because he had the physical copies. He was mailing them out to two different segments of folks, right? The prospective clients and the strategic partners. And this is part of my job is helping with the marketing plan, getting that book in the hands of prospective clients and people who were interfacing with his ideal client. And he was engaging new clients. He was like, this is the best thing ever, you know? And so, and it was interesting because it, all along the process was just very easy. Found my website, scheduled a discovery call, and it doesn't always work like this, but it's really nice when it does. Um, I want to hire you. How soon can we get started? Send me your agreement. And I woke up with 60,000 less in my bank account than I went to bed with that night. Very easy project. So just really sailed through the process and he's already just really monetizing it. And I was thinking, gosh, you know what? The and the one month book anniversary, which will be mm -hmm. three months after he started sending out books, right? So one month after the book was officially published, but three months after he started sending out the books, I want to check in with him and see what his uh, book count is because we're right uh, past the three month mark. So when I'm talking to someone about getting an ROI, um, I think that royalties or selling books is unless you're fiction, right? So we're not talking about fiction. We're talking about nonfiction where you're the SME, the subject matter expert, and you're getting your book in the hands of people. Um, so you're doing prescriptive or transformational nonfiction where you're helping someone to get a result where they're avoiding pain, gaining pleasure, or both. It's number four or five on the list. Number one is getting new business. So it's engaging clients and customers. Number two is getting in front of people. So whether that's paid speaking engagements or free speaking engagements that put you in front of people that are your ideal client. And so all of these factor into your ROI and also engaging clients or customers or getting hired in your area of expertise, whatever that looks like. So sometimes it's coaching, sometimes it's consulting. There are lots of different income streams that can come with publishing a book brand awareness, name and face recognition, those sorts of things, exposure to your other products. So what else you sell in, right? Are you just selling one thing? Probably not, right? Um, so, and also exposure to your backlist. So your backlist is, are the other books that you've published. So what are the other products or services or books? What is it that you're doing for money? <laughs> Right. And how are people finding you? So there are all these things on the list of uh, opportunities for monetizing your book, including courses. Right. Because I can't say monetize your book without adding. <laughs> the <board. laughs> the end. There's no contract. And then saying finally, that, but <laughs> yes. And then finally royalties. And for some people, it is no concern. They are geographically limited. They only engage clients in their geographic area. There are, there is no online publication. I've done a couple of books where there, we did not publish on Amazon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It did not matter. He, my clients simply wanted copies to pass out to prospective clients in their geographic area. That number of people is very low. Uh, however, interestingly, a small but mighty portion of my 
clients come from discovering my books online. And I wouldn't want to take that away. So even if, and this is just a, a little a peek into strategy, even if you think, well, like, what are, what's the likelihood someone's going to go onto Amazon and find someone to do what I do? And let's let's make it a very high level thing, like um, insure your island or your art collection or your jewelry collection or your airplane collection, right? So I've worked with firms that are uh, in that at that level, or even a family office, right? Which is financial advisor, wealth manager, family office person. So what are the chances someone's going to read a book that they find on Amazon organically, and then they're going to hire your family office? Very, very low, but don't take that away because you never know. Amazon, yeah. when algorithms are engaged correctly, are very good at suggesting books. You just don't know how someone is going to come across your book and your business or firm and hire you. So all of that to say is people expect an ROI from their book very quickly and it can come. They expect the ROI from their book to come through royalties and that can happen, but that's more of a longer term play. I like right. to look at the strategy of an ROI and how can someone monetize their book as soon as possible, but also understanding that it's the long-term play, which is why I say it's the 10 by 10, right? It's you want a 10X return on your investment every year, year over year for 10 years. I'm not looking at creating a book that's like, you know, how to survive COVID in 2021. Right. Right. Because that's not evergreen material. So that those are my initial thoughts on when and how to, ex how to expect and to receive an ROI on your book. I love it. Um, and I just want to kind of pull two highlights out of there that I really picked up on that, you know, kind of are the recurring theme whenever we've talked about this is that yeah. if you want the faster path to ROI, you know, tie it to your high ticket offer or one of your right. more lucrative opportunities in your business might not be your high ticket, but it could be something that consistently feeds you. Right. Oh. Um, and yeah. I think that's great for several reasons. One, when you and I had this conversation, when I was getting ready to put out Monetize Your Book with the Course, it was my first nonfiction book. I was excited. I had very little expectation that the book would fly off the shelves and be a household thing. You know, it's about creating courses and it's about mm -hmm. specifically right. doing that from nonfiction books. It's a very niche thing, but I knew it had a lot of value and that I could provide value to people in the book and then also in other complementary ways. One being, like you said, through selling uh, upgrades to courses. Someone might read the book and they go buy a course or reach out to me and say, Hey, now that I've read your book and I see all the stuff that's involved here, can I just hire you or someone else to do this? Right. Or can I, can I have you coach me through this? Like, yeah. and those, those conversations sometimes, uh, blow my mind because I'll be like, so how did you find out about me? And they're like, I read your book. And I'm like, really? And immediately I'm like, there's that ROI. You know, there's that intangible right. can't can't see who's buying my book in Amazon. Uh, but you meet them when they come to you for for yep. for a new type of thing. Yeah. Yep. So to me, that was just wonderful to be able to experience that. But every time that's happened, I've thought about that conversation about ROI. I'm like, look, this is this is us getting getting exactly to that point. Right? It's like yep. these calls would have not happened had it not been for the book. And yep. this is the book paying itself off um, when when those people agree to those types of services or whatever. Um, also, I feel like it's been helpful to me to have the book as an offer to my coaching clients. So when I have someone come to me for coaching directly and they haven't read my book yet, and I tell them, "Hey, I'll I'll send, I'll mail you a a, a yeah. paperback copy of 100%. my book." Yeah. It's another push over the edge in value that they just absolutely love. They're like, "Really?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll send it to you now." And by the time we meet in a week or two, you'll you'll have the book in your hand, and they're just thrilled with that. That to me is is a is a level of ROI related to my coaching that you know isn't the traditional thought of like you came to me through the book, um, but that book is paying off in spades when they open that book before our session and they go, oh wow, this dude really does know what he's talking about, and I'm even yep. further invested now than I was. You know, it just bolsters your ability right. to work with that person. So I love that you brought that up because those are ways I've kind of realized um, uh, that value of, of reaching ROI on the book uh, beyond what I think my initial, you know, like you said, everyone thinks about how, when will I make money on on royalties or 
Sales well, it's a, it's a logical question. You think I publish a book and I get paid when I sell books. And I'll, I can use Ali Hamyari's book, Discipline. We just did this book for Beautiful him. Book. Um, well, it made me cry when I saw the cover. I thought it was uh, one of the best things that I've done with, uh, with Dino. And um, when we were talking, uh, he has a protection dog service, dog training, a private jet, service multiple companies and so when i did his book map for him his book marketing action plan i put in all of the things because we were talking about over time this is a young guy him doing speaking engagements and incidentally i said you have the one thing that every speaker wants to have and he's like what's that and i said a private jet <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice. flying commercial flying commercial is one of the reasons that i don't speak as often as i would because all of the time that goes into the time and expense and aggravation that goes into commercial air travel, um, just the juice is not worth the squeeze, generally speaking. But also, the book now. Um, but also um, the investment for the book is the equivalent to a protection dog. So and so at his book launch party, I had this lovely conversation with this couple who have purchased now two protection dogs. Oh, and you don't think about executives and wealthy people and famous people who need protection dogs or want to have protection dogs. And there's actually a lot of them. And so it's one or two protection dogs and he's more than made back his investment. And now we're off to the races and now we're green. We're in the green. We're revenue positive for as long, as long as the book shall live. Right. So yeah, anything I from here on out is green. Yes. It's just, Yes, we're, we've we, we've broken even, as you said, and now we're revenue positive, and the book has been out nine days. Right. So when Amazing. you think about, gosh, you know, I had uh, dinner with another client of mine, and they were like, "We should probably get a protection dog." So boop, made the introduction, and so you know, comes full circle. All of that to say, when you're thinking about the R ROI opportunities and potential for your book you'll want to have revenue from royalties on that list. However, what you want to think about is how many clients or customers or widgets or online products do I need to sell in order to get um, back to even? And then what's my goal? So part of the book map is a 10-year goal. What's going to really make this worth it, right? Uh -oh. How many how many courses can we sell over 10 years? So what's our, what, so let's just say we want to, uh, Ali would want to do one new protection dog every quarter. So four protection dogs in a year is 40 protection dogs over 10 years, uh, 60,000 or more for a protection dog. So what's 40 times 60? Is that $2.4 million? from one book and that's just one revenue yeah. stream. That's not speaking engagements. That isn't book royalties. His book is for entrepreneurs. So anyone can read the book. And that's just one book. When we think about Beth's upcoming book with college students, she's charging fees that are uh, in varying degree. So in very short order, she only has to help a dozen families, let's say half a dozen families before she's broken even, but she would want to help lots and lots of families through her various offerings, her one-on-one -on -one basic service, her one-on-one -on -one all in, we do everything for you service, right? We write, help you right. write the essays and we help you to come up with all the, you know, fill out your FAFSA forms and all the things that I'm learning about, right? So it's, it, there's a lot to, con, to be considered. So you want to think about what is it that I do for money? And you used a high ticket offer. So maybe you have a mastermind or maybe you have high level consulting or you're an executive coach or a business coach or a life coach or you coach or you have courses or you have other books or you have some kind of service that you sell start to play with the numbers a little bit and all of a sudden the money that you're investing in do it yourself so the number that i provide in publishing phd is to expect to pay around between 12 you know, in 15,000 to really do your book well. If you're a first time author, you want to add five to 10 grand on the top of that because you need a book doctor right. to help you with the structure of your book. So if you're doing everything yourself, it's still going to cost you a decent amount of money 
to do the book, which is why some people come to me because they look at that list and go, <laughs> here's my American Express card. You do it, Honoré. Yeah. You can do it. I don't want to. I don't want to have to think about this too hard. Just take it and go. I, right. Well, as some people say to me, I make a half a million dollars in an afternoon. It does not make sense for me to try to figure out how to do this. Just like I yeah, don't they're, do a lot of administrative tasks, right? It, the yeah. learning curve is too steep. So when they've you got think more about, money than time. They have more money than time. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. when you have, but even if you don't, you do want to definitely educate yourself on the fastest, easiest, easiest path to do it and still do it well and professionally. Nevertheless, when you're thinking about what it is that you sell, you want to think about it in terms of what's my break even number? Just, you know, how many things do I have to sell? It's not going to be that many when right. you're using your book effectively and then set a one year goal. And if you only can engage one new client a month or one or one client a quarter, what's the net revenue for that? And then multiply that and multiply that again and give yourself that one year goal, the 10 year goal. And then when you look at the, the possibilities, what's possible from it, then 12 or $15,000 or 60,000 or 150,000 is not that much when you think about what the potential upside is when you do it well. Right. So I think people are just focused on what's the money that I'm spending and you're not lighting it on fire because your fingers are cold. You're investing it in creating a business asset that's going to work for you, not unlike your website, not unlike your business cards or your brochures or things like that. A book just happens to be that one thing that's going to work really hard for you for a very long time when it's done well. Right. You know, one so of the things that that's helped yeah, people to yeah. have a shift in the, in their consciousness about, about investing in a book. Yeah. I, I think it, it makes so much sense in other areas too, because like for me, I exchanged book money for other money, right? Like I, you know, I think we, we tend to think like it's one, one or the other, as far as like, well, if I, if I do the book, I can't do these things. Sometimes doing the book is better than spending your money other places. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, um, uh, ads, right? Like ad revenue. So mm -hmm. like, or not ad mm -hmm. revenue, but ad expense, right? So rather than spend money on all these ads, I can spend money on book production, create an asset for my business mm -hmm. that has legs that will go on indefinitely, you know, outlive those ads by, by many multiples. And then when I do have these events, I can bring the book and the book is going to be my advertising expense for that, for that uh, event. I, I did a speaking gig, um, last summer. There were a couple other speakers there. We all had our books on the tables. Our books are what started the conversations. Like people were just walking by us and then people would stop. Oh, you have a book. Yep. Yes. And they'd start talking about the book. If they buy the book and I never hear from them again, that's, you know, that's cool, whatever. But like if they buy the book, most of the time they, they become convinced that's, that's a pretty good indicator that they're really interested in the topic um, and potentially services in that area. So that was really helpful. Um, also, uh, so ad rev ad expense for the book versus services has another wrinkle on it. Um, and that other wrinkle is that we can, spend money advertising the book to a much larger audience than we can to people yeah. that are specifically looking for services. Yep. So if you're looking to spread your ads across the larger audience, you may have more accessibility with a book than you do your services. And so spending money on the book ads to get those out gets essentially pays for advertising in a much larger net to your, to your service uh, population, but they're not, in this loop where if they don't commit to a service agreement, there's nothing, right? They might commit to the book, then commit to a service agreement. There's something there for the people that don't ever follow through with the service agreement or pursuing services, they may still buy the book. So to me, like it's a, it's a natural stepping stone in your advertising expense to advertise the book in the same area that you have your, uh, your expenses for advertising your services. Um, right. And then there's one last thing I wanted to ask you, because I know you're just the perfect person to ask about this. Okay, I'm ready. Because you've done this. And this is the thing, because it's not a very common thing. But there are nonfiction authors out there whose whole goal is to actually make the royalty break even or more on the book and it not be tied to services and other things. And you've actually sold books 
that far exceeded and were outside mm -hmm. of the area of your services, right? Yep. Um, so there's there's an experience there that you have that a lot of people don't have. And do you view those book projects any differently? Because the goal of that book is to sell books, right? Versus ladder it over to other offers in your business. No, it's just the, what's the job of the book. Then the job of the book is to sell books as opposed to the job of the book is to sell the author and books. Right. And that changes right. your marketing. It changes the it changes the um the content of the book it changes the front matter it changes the back matter it changes the the, the actual content of the book it changes the call to action it changes the marketing plan if there's there's quite nice. a bit that goes into it there's not one size fits all a book map is not a book map right a book marketing action plan which if you want a a uh, roadmap for that. It's in my book, You Must Market Your Book, which is coming out in German in a few weeks, which is kind of cool. I saw that. Um, so <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> but I do provide my book map um, formula process template in that book. So you can create your own book map. And the purpose of the book was really to teach people to think about book marketing differently, right? So right. I'm getting a lot of people after the fact before they've already made some of the the, for better or worse, the key decisions that inform and influence whether their book is actually going to be marketable. I'm assuming we're we're working with a quality book that's optimized, that's creating an author reader relationship that's monetized and monetizable so that it can do its job, whatever its job is. But you can get uh, that template and that process by uh, purchasing You Must Market Your Book or uh, the, the course book marketing mastery that goes with it. So nonetheless, um, I kind of come back to, to zero on a book before I write a book, I'm really thinking about what the job of the book is so that when I have a decision to make about the book, the contents, the front matter, the back matter, the, uh, call to action, the, uh, book bonuses, everything about the book, uh, I, has to be predicated on what the ultimate job of the book is and what's in it for the author. What do they want the book to do? And so that's where I start. So whenever someone says, well, now what do I do? It's like, well, let's, you know, let's, let's start at the very beginning, right? Joe Ramey. Right. <laughs> right. Let's start at the very beginning because there are a lot of things to think about before we move forward. Right. So, um, if you guys are interested in learning like even more about these types of topics, um, Honoré's, you know, newsletter is unbelievable. Um, you guys can join her list and she gives daily bite-sized, super <laughs> valuable. I've been on that list for three years. I'm still on that list every day. I save those, um, those emails. That's very kind checks in the mail. Actually, I sent you a money tree so you can print your own checks. <laughs> But on that same page, thank you for all of that, Lucas. That's yeah. very kind of you. On that same page, on that contact page is a way for you to download You Must Write a Book, which is another way for you to get in conversation with people. Very often people will read You Must Write a Book and then say, I want to sit down and talk with you about my book. And I don't help or can't help more people than I can. So as many books as I do... I say no to a lot of people and then point them in the general direction of other resources or people that can help them. Your right. book can do the same thing. Your book can can be um, not a funnel, but a, not a barrier. Um, English. I haven't slept for days. What's the word? Um, <laughs> One word, two syllables. Colander. <laughs> colander. What's another word for uh, colander? Like a kind of a, a strainer? Uh, a strainer, a filter? yes. A filter. Thank you. English. Gotcha. <laughs> filter. If you had to or, type it, you'd have been done by now. <laughs> I know. I know. It will be a filter for helping people to find you who are the right fit for you. And if they're not the right fit for you, perhaps they would be um, the right fit for someone that you know, which is kind of a, a, another thing I was thinking about in this conversation, Lucas, is that when um, someone reads your book and they go, well, I don't really want to create a course, right? I have a book. I'm happy with what my book is doing. 
But then they talk to someone else and someone else says, you know, I, I, I really need to turn my book into a course. They're going to go, oh, you know what? I read this guy's book. Yeah. And then they'll send them over to you. And this is one of the wonderful things about having your words in print and having a book is that you never know what degree someone will be. And so almost all of my clients have come to me directly from a book that they have found on Amazon or I have given them or someone else has given them, which is another part of the strategy is getting your books in the hands of people who can get your books in the hands of people. The number one way people find out about a book is through personal recommendation. And right. the more you plant the seeds of your books in all the places, the more likelihood the right and perfect client is going to pick up your book and say, where have you been on my life? You are the person that I'm looking for. You are exact. I can't believe that we have crossed paths at this moment in time because you were exactly the person either I knew I wanted, but I didn't know existed or I didn't know that I didn't know. Right. right. I had unconscious incompetence. And yet here you are. This is exactly what I need next. Or it's in the future for me to, to do this in the near, you know, to do at some point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it's wild how this all works because I never feel like I'm going to miss out on an opportunity uh, because I have the book. I can give someone who's maybe yeah. not all in for services. I'm like, Hey, you know, go pick up the book, man. It's, it's really informative. And they were like, you know, I'll do that. And I'll get a book sale and all's well. And, and honestly, guys, I publish fiction and nonfiction right now. And my nonfiction is far more profitable per book by price and revenue um, because it is a nonfiction book with a lot of really good information in it. I can sell it yep. for a higher price point in that market than I can sell my fiction in. Fiction's a little bit different and very competitive. Yep. Um, <clears throat> and there's just not as many options out there when it comes to the nonfiction stuff uh, in certain certain niche areas. So, you know, I, I never look at my nonfiction book and go, man, it just can't stack up on, on revenue to, to my services. Mm -hmm. You know, I can make X amount mm -hmm. an hour and that book just doesn't cut the cake. I, I look at that and I go, man, look at how much that book earns multiples more per sale yeah. than my fiction does. And look at how many clients have come to me through that book. It's, it's the least the least of my and, concerns this weather. And you're just getting warmed up. The book is a year old, not even just a year old. Just getting warmed up. Just getting yep. warmed up. So we have, so, so the, it has not yet seen its potential. You must write a book was published eight years ago, not quite eight years ago, seven wow. and a half years ago. And it is a two comma book for me. Right. At this point. Yeah. In terms of book sales, series book sales, course sales, the mastermind and the custom books Services. that I do. Yeah. Yeah. So Am I glad that I wrote that book in 78 days because Amazon said, would you please write a book about why people should write and publish a book on Amazon? <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. One million percent. And and when I talked to uh, someone yesterday, uh, he said someone asked him if he had any regrets about doing his book. And he said, yes, my one regret is I didn't jump in sooner. Hmm. That I spent too much time noodling about it because I could have been in the place I'm in now months earlier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's not to say that, you know, I think timing is everything, right? So someone may have your book and think about monetizing their book with a course for three years and three years. I'm always like, I'm not retiring anytime soon. So whenever you're ready, I'll be here. <laughs> right. I'll be more expensive. <laughs> It'll cost more. <laughs> It'll cost more and you might have to wait longer, but I'll be here. You're going to be there. Uh, our our yeah. assets and our resources are still going to be there. Yeah. And so timing is everything. And I, I don't want someone to make a decision. You know, they have to be an absolute yes. Otherwise, it's a no or, or wait until it's an absolute yes. But that's something to consider, right? The things that I have done that I've messed around in my head about, I wish I had just done them sooner, right? Or not done them at all. But that's yeah. a different conversation. <laughs> Well, you were also smart enough to to recognize when there was a significant prompt for what you needed to be doing and you were like, I'm on it, right? It's yep. like, yep. you know, you didn't waffle, you committed to it, you got it done and now yep. look at you, it's been, it's been beneficial. And that yep. book uh, brought you other writing projects. You know, I think that- Oh, and still does. Yeah. Yep. I just, like co-authoring opportunities. 
Well, and, and still is. I have yep. one that I'm that I'm working um, through the process of determining if it's a right a right um, uh, fit right now. So the books that I get to work on that people hire me to do the the you know very rare collaborative projects that I entertain. Some of the collaborative pro projects I've done in the past. Right. Um, and the ideas that I have. So yeah, I, I, I am particularly passionate about it. They say that a surgeon wants to cut, right? Hmm. That's what they're trained to do. I want everyone to do a book, right? I'm the book ladies. I want everyone okay. to do a book and to be on the other side of having a great book that's working hard on their behalf. I was just thinking about you wanting to cut me or something. <laughs> well, there are times. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Byron's I'm just like, saying, whatever someone is inclined to do, right? Yeah. If yeah. a doctor wants to medicate you, a surgeon wants to cut you, um, a trainer wants you to work out, a dietitian wants you to diet, right? So I'm just kind of making some grand, sure. applying some grand their solutions. Yes, you're applying the solution that you're most enamored with, you're most trained sure. in, that, that most feels natural to you. To me, I am the person who has i have a few boxes that are left unchecked and having a book has helped me to bypass not having those boxes checked and right. that's very helpful and so i want to give that gift to as many people as i can for as long as i can that's right yeah well guys we're uh right up against the end of our time here so if you have any last minute questions please go ahead and drop them in the chat in the next minute Please. um in yeah. the meantime honore and i'll be wrapping this thing up so we can um, get you guys back to your to your regularly scheduled programming and your lives. Um, we would yep. invite you guys, or we do invite you guys to come, you know, back here every week, Thursdays, same bat time, same bat channel, um, 11 yeah. o'clock Eastern, live, uh, 10 o'clock Central, LinkedIn, YouTube, all the places, Facebook. Oh, we love them. If you're looking for a place to watch all of our former episodes in one easy to kind of access place, YouTube channel is the place to go. You guys should definitely subscribe there, whether you are a uh, continuous weekly viewer on YouTube or not, because um, that's one place where all of our content is uh, is stored forever and ever. Amen. And we've got a little something coming up for you guys uh, that starts next week. Honore and I are going to be publishing some weekly oh. content like what are we doing <laughs> <laughs> and we're starting with some articles that honore has been uh, kind enough to produce and so you know it's going to be awesome and uh, we'll have some information to share with you guys uh by next week's episode about exactly how to get on that list yeah. um so yeah honore any parting thoughts before we before we break off no i just appreciate anyone who has watched this long Thank you for watching. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Lucas, for co-hosting. Thank you to Thanks, everyone man. who is watching. And of course, we will have uh, everything that we mentioned in the, the show notes. No promises on the timing, but they will be there sooner than later. <laughs> and we will be back next week with more information. But if there's something on this topic that we didn't cover that you would like us to cover, feel free to put it in the chat and we will add it to a future live. That's right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Honoré. Thank you guys, everyone, for tuning in and hanging out with us. It's a, it's a joy for us to be able to meet with you guys every week. It's kind of like our cool thing that we look forward to. And um, yes. and uh, it's because you're here and we get to interact with you guys and have some fun Definitely. and nerd out on some things we like. But um, Honoré, next week, ma'am. See you then. Sir, see you then. <laughs> I'll be into Bye, guys. <laughs> Au revoir. Isn't that what you're supposed to say? Isn't uh, that the French? I'll be intro. I'll see you later. Yeah. Oh, who, what am I talking about? I had no, abs that's a bit, that's, that's all I got for French. Do I say Arrivederci for you? Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Uh, Tommy Cutlets. Okay. All right, let me, let me cut this before I get a contract with uh, the Giants. <laughs> Talk to you guys okay. later. Bye. Thanks, Renee.